Hello, welcome to our Facebook Live or YouTube, depending on what platform you're on. I am Paula Nowak, your host with Canine Country Academy, and we're excited to talk about adding a dog, typically a third dog, because that seems to be a magical number for people, uh, to your household. And my uh, guests here have also added third and more dogs at times. So I'll let them introduce themselves. Go ahead. My name is Chelsea. I'm a CPDTKA, a KPA CTP, and a CTDI with Positive Futures in Atlanta, Georgia. And my breed of choice personally is the Alaskan Malamute. Currently have three of them, which is why we're chatting about that today, but certainly help people with a wide variety of breeds. Hi, my name is Katie. Uh, I own Wise Mind Canine in Illinois, and my breed of choice was definitely the German Shepherd. Uh, I do have a mixed breed boy as my third dog, and he is a Chinese Sharpe Border Collie mix. So that's a little fun. And I am an IAABC ADT. All right. So um, I my preferred breed of choice is Toy Fox Terriers, if you guys didn't already know. And uh, you know, we have all had the experience of adding dogs and we're also professionals and we help people uh, to integrate dogs or reintegrate dogs or address issues. And so this topic came up because we all talk about it. We've all lived it, but also a lot of people have asked recently thinking about adding a third dog. And I was like, well, if, if a couple of people are asking, more people want to know. And so you guys who are watching this live or the recording, feel free to ask questions and I'll prompt us throughout. Um, but when we think about adding a third dog, like why is three, and I'm going to kick this to Katie because she and I have talked about it in depth, like why is three like the, the tipping point for a lot of people, do you think? So many reasons. I think <laughs> the first one, though, is just that when you hit that third dog, you're encountering dynamics that you typically don't always have when you have two. So it could be the first time that you are having a large age gap between dogs. So you have dogs in very different life stages for the first time. Uh, a lot of times with the third dog, people are mixing breeds or mixing, you know, large and small dogs, which creates complications. Um, things like same sex pairs. Hopefully I'm returning here. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Technology is awesome. A glitch. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what that was. The good news is we can still hear you. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, so when you have these strange dynamics kind of entering your life that you weren't expecting, you may have had a really simple multi-dog household where everyone was getting along, and then we add this third dog, and it's super different all of a sudden. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think about, you know, because I traditionally stay in the same dog genre, right, terriers, but there's definitely been huge age gaps and uh, definitely size differences within the terriers. Chelsea, what are your thoughts on people adding a third dog and why it's like the tipping point for problems? Uh, you know, I was, one thing that I was gonna mention that you just brought up was the age difference. You know, I see, especially in my household, this is true right now as well. I have two dogs that are veterans and I have one dog that is very young, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you bring that younger dog into the house, that energy level is just so different and sometimes, if your older dogs have really settled into this nice routine, that can be hard for them to kind of bring in something that's a lot more energy, a lot more excitement, and potentially a lot more stress. Um, and then I, I really liked what Katie said too about those relationship dynamics, right? We know that relationships are really complicated between people. They're complicated between people and their dogs and with the dogs between themselves. And so oftentimes you'll see dogs that have gotten along or handled resources okay, but then you've got this new dog that you're bringing in and all of those relationships are gonna have to be readjusted. And that's normal and natural, but sometimes that can create conflict. One of the things I see with our clients is they're in a different phase of their life as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Right? So, you know, 10 years ago, you were 10 years younger and now you're getting, you know, whether it's a young dog or not, you know, and your lifestyle changes too. So not only the dogs are the challenge, but you're you're different. You're not in the same headspace or have the same lifestyle that you did. And that can be a pro or a con depending on, you know, how you're experiencing it um, up to this point. You know, I'll say, I'll bounce off that too. You know, I generally consider myself an active person. I do quite a bit 
in my personal life with my dogs and I include them as much as possible. But I will say bringing a new puppy in after my last puppy was eight years ago. Like, that's a long time, you know, and, and I remember I was reflecting back on him when he was younger and he definitely was energetic and had a hard time relaxing, right? That wasn't a skill that was in his toolbox yet, but we all got settled into this nice routine and you kind of get used to what those dogs need right? And then bringing that third dog into the home, you still have to make sure that your other dog's needs are met, but they're going to be completely different than that third dog that you're bringing in. And so you have to balance meeting everybody's needs on an individual basis, mm -hmm. as well as meeting their needs together as a group. And I think that that takes a lot more planning and a lot more energy than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah, yeah. I think there's less, yeah. sorry. That's okay. There is less everything to go around. There's less of your time. There's less money to be allocated to each individual dog. There, you know, there, there are huge changes in the human dynamics. And I think a lot of people are concerned like about what's happening with the dogs when you add a third dog, but the human element is really real. It can be really frustrating to change your entire lifestyle too, along with your dogs. <laughs> yes. And I think that's great because we all have the aspect of looking at the whole picture. It's not just the dogs or just the person or just the environment. Like it's everything. And it, I'm saying this not to scare people. And I'm, I, I don't know about you ladies, but like if anyone ever asked me like, should I get another dog? Literally I'm instantly no. Like I'm always no. It's rare for me to say like, oh yeah, you should get another dog. Um, because it's hard. <laughs> it's really difficult. And you know, we all have significant others in our lives too. So that's another component of like integrating everybody in the household and us being professionals and trying to keep it together that we're not like over preparing, uh, you know, our significant other too. So there's a lot that goes into this. So not to scare anybody, but. I think, I think though, in all honesty, a little bit of fear is probably a good thing just <laughs> yeah. because it gets you to pause for a moment. I mean, how many times have you like impulsively done something in your life, right? Like a lot of people who love dogs, they're like, oh my God, I've got puppy people puppy fever. I really want to go out and get another puppy. And I'm like, hold on. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's think about everything because while there are a lot of beautiful and wonderful things about bringing that third dog in, there's also some concerns that we really need to think about and plan ahead for. Right. So I think like just a little bit of like alertness, a little bit of fear is probably a good thing. Yeah. When don't you're thinking about this. Don't scare yourself off completely, yeah. <laughs> but also know that it, probably is harder and needs a little more thought than you think it does. Just go in with your eyes wide open and it'll go much better. Yeah. Yes. And, and just be prepared for the unknown or for the stress. And I will say, I don't know about you guys, but and please let us know in the comments, ask your questions too. But um, a raise of hands, like I used to just add dogs willy nilly to my household, like back in the day before I knew any better. Like I would bring foster dogs in, like I've had up to five dogs of my own personally. And before I was a professional and knew anything, like I knew nothing. And I would bring in foster dogs from the shelter and like introduce them in my hallway. Okay. I can't tell you how many times I did that and it went fine. Yeah. Right. But today, adding Yay. a third dog, like, yeah, it's like, it's like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> like back in the day, we just, I didn't know anything. So it was fine. I definitely went from one to two very quickly without a whole lot of like, prep and planning, but every other decision I made after that was like <laughs> very planned, like <laughs> thinking of everything really like years in the making Searching. before making it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think remember, as we grow as people, that decision also grows. Definitely. Like I remember 10 years ago, I'm adding my second dog and I could find nothing on the internet about introducing dogs. Like I did the whole parallel walk, neutral location. And then I was like, oh no, what comes next? And like, luckily what comes next was fairly easy with those two. But now I look back on that now and it's just like, oh no. Right, and how you help people, Katie, to like get to that point now. You're like, so there's gonna be like a 900 steps. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many steps for you. <laughs> Never fear, I'm here with you. <laughs> I have a plan. Yeah. <laughs> so in thinking about, you know, now that we know what we know <laughs> as pet owners and professionals, 
what are some things before you even think about number three or the next dog that you would like existing dogs to have under control, have skills, and it could be unique to the individual dog, of course, but what are some things that uh, come to mind that you'd like to prep for? Go ahead, Katie. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, one of the big things for me is not assuming that behavior problems are just going to be okay when you add another dog. Like, Especially you add a puppy, right? <laughs> right. Like there is a high potential. Now you will have two dogs with the same behavior problem. Or that behavior problem will interact with another behavior problem that your next dog has. And now it's really complicated. So wherever possible, I want you to be happy with the behaviors of the dogs you have mm -hmm. before you add another. Uh, and my favorite skills, though, for multi-dog households are actually super simple. I like a positive interrupter. I like a hand target. And I like a recall. Just all like the theme for me is, can you disengage from the other dog when I ask you to? I would, I agree with that. I, I definitely say like, let's make sure we don't have any red flags behavior wise with the existing dogs. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are like, oh, my dog has separation anxiety. They're lonely. Let's get another one. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Um, <laughs> I agree. You know, my positive interrupters, my um, moving in and out of gates, um, recall and relaxing are on mats are kind of my defaults for the adult dogs in the home to have. And then I would add on to say, um, you know, discussion about social levels with the other two dogs in the house. Yeah. You know, I've, I've spoken with some clients that the only social interactions that those dogs have had successfully have been with each other, which is not necessarily the end of that discussion, but it's definitely something that we need to talk about and really make sure that we're then planning that intro wisely because not all dogs in your current home are going to be cool with you bringing another dog into the home, right? And so then we've got a lot of relationship struggles there. So I think I always like to talk to people about not only what their dogs are comfortable with and what kind of social interactions those dogs enjoy, but then I think that also leads you to that discussion of, okay, well, like, let's assume that we do everything right and this still doesn't work out how we planned, right? Mm -hmm. Like, our, what is our game plan then? Do we have reasonable next steps to make sure that everybody in the home is living their most happy, least stressed life, which those are hard discussions to have. They are. And one of the things that um, I personally have utilized is, you know, it wasn't behavior problems necessarily, but um, my dogs get really excited when it's time for meals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I will say that looking back, getting all these dogs you know, over time. Now we have three, but we've had five is looking back. If I could have stopped a behavior, I didn't want to continue with everyone else because everyone else was like me too. I love eating as well. So um, when we got down to, you know, two or three dogs and we were thinking about, okay, we're going to add and we took uh, pretty quickly after we lose somebody because we can't live without another dog is, you know, okay, now we really need to work on what are we going to do to reduce that, you know, arousal around mealtime that mm -hmm. we've built into these dogs and we don't want the next dog to have that thing too, because it just adds on um, and just, it's hard to stop. And I, I know that most people are not preventative. It's not our nature as humans. Um, so if you, if you're in that position, you think you're going to add, it's like, well, what would I fine tune? what would I make a little bit easier on myself? So when I bring the next dog in, I just have to teach them what to do. They're not kind of feeding off of the other dog um, of something you don't like. And it doesn't have to be anything major, just something that maybe is a nuisance to your household. I think to add on to that too, you know, especially if we're talking about like mealtimes, that brings up the idea of resources, which as trainers, we all know that resources can become problems between people and dogs and between dogs and dogs. And so I think you know, my trainer brain, which I think a lot of pet owners brains probably don't go there is what in my current routine might be working for these two dogs, but might potentially put a group of three dogs into conflict, right? And so then I think we have to know what could potentially trigger a problem, right? And then that might kind of direct us to what behaviors we might want to work on with 
the older dogs before we bring in another dog, but that can all get pretty complicated, you know? And I think sometimes that really depends on how much knowledge that pet owner might have which would then lead them to be proactive or, or not know what they should be proactive on. Yes. Yeah. I think when you start looking at those routines and changing them too, like it can be hard to figure out exactly how to do that. And the mm -hmm. way I, I like to have people think about it before the dog comes home, if possible, is like what management layers can we put in place to give these dogs their separate spaces so gates, you know, um, exercise pens, that sort of thing. And can we start doing it right now when the third dog isn't here mm -hmm. so that we can troubleshoot what this looks like and help these dogs adjust and create a new normal for them before they have the stress of a new dog in the home? Mm -hmm. Yes, because it is, it is stressful. And uh, Rachel Anderson shared here, um, stationing at mealtimes and high arousal situations like guests coming over has been a game changer for her household. Best behavior to, to really train um, is it, it, looking at what do I need? And that's something that a lot of us need is that high arousal excitement that they need to address. All right. So, you know, we've addressed that. And what I will say is the, you know, our team at Canyon Country Academy, Chelsea's team and Katie, they are pros at helping you assess current dogs and what might they need to work on. So if you're thinking about it, like reach out. Katie's 100% virtual. Chelsea and I are um, local to Georgia, but we have a network. So if you're like, we're not nearby and we need somebody in person, like let us know. We will help you find someone who can help you. We love like we as trainers love when people are like, I'm thinking about getting a dog. We're like, yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're like the unicorn person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah unicorn for sure. Uh, because then we can help you prepare existing households, setting expectations, but also finding that next dog. Um, and so what are some things that, and I know we've got some questions too, so I'll jump in those in a second. Um, so thank you guys for participating. What are some things when you think about your dynamics at home, with current dogs that you think, what do I need? If I could like, you know, create like weird science, this dog that I'm going to add, whether it's a puppy, a rescue, whatever, how would I figure out the best match for number three? Um, what are some things maybe you've done yourself or helped people with in considering what's the best fit if I get a third? I think Chelsea kind of touched on that already a little bit about thinking about the social interactions that your dog is currently able to have. And for me, like I look at, okay, what is, what is working for the two dogs that I have? So my original two dogs, they um, thrived on coexisting without a ton of interaction. That meant, you know, if I'm bringing another dog into the home, they're going to have to have either that same level of like coexistence without a ton of interaction, or they're going to have to have really savvy social skills and like conflict resolution behavior if they're bringing that new dynamic into my home. So it, it takes a lot of like thinking about what your dogs like about each other and what they don't like about each other and trying to locate that in, you know, a, whatever dog you're adopting or getting from a breeder. Yeah. I would also say, you know, besides just the relationship between the two of them, the relationship that they have with other dogs they've had interactions with. So sure. if you often take your dog out to play groups with friends or group hikes, you know, what kinds of energy levels of other dogs do they really jive with, right? Like maybe they're really more relaxed and they prefer a dog that is a little bit more relaxed. So if you are bringing an adult dog into the home, you might look at how that other dog prefers to play and kind of what their overall energy level is. You know, an older dog that's maybe having some orthopedic issues isn't going to love something really young and high strung that's like jumping all over them because it hurts and it's annoying, right? And they're not into that. So I think thinking about how your dog enjoys life with you, with, you know, other dogs they interact with will help you kind of choose maybe breed or choose size. Um, if you're bringing a puppy into the home, obviously puppies are a little bit more malleable, but they're also a lot more work and a lot more energy. So there's so many different dynamics that you need to think about 
you know, even deciding what's the best fit for your individual home and what's most likely to kind of find you success. Yes. And I want to touch on too, I think a lot of people don't think about Katie's situation where her two existing dogs um, coexisted. Like they weren't having a problem, but they weren't necessarily like, hey buddy, let's like wrestle or chase or whatever. That just wasn't their jam with those, you know, that personality and that's okay. But like number three, either needs to do that same thing or be able to build individual relationships. And I've seen that in my household adding Ahsoka is she needed to be able to figure out like I can be crazy with him, but I can't be crazy with him yes. and for everyone's safety. Um, so it's, it's okay. Like it's not saying that your dog has to be overly social, but you have to, you know, this is like a dating app and you're trying to find the right match. Um, and sometimes it doesn't always work. I've had to rehome a dog. Sometimes it doesn't work. So if you need that flexibility, you need to have a rescue group or whoever you're working with to find a dog, that it's okay to return a dog. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Like what are things that we'll, we'll decide is a no-go. Um, so Abby has a question. How do you manage bringing home a third dog that has different energy needs? Because it's a perfect topic right now. Uh, than the resident dog. So yeah. <laughs> I feel like she has some insight into this. <laughs> Ooh, I wonder. She might have some experience with my household. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not easy. I will say, you know, my youngest has more energy and more drive and wants to do more things than I've experienced with other puppies that I've brought into my home. <laughs> which personally I love. I wanted a sport dog. I wanted a dog that would thrive in harness and want to do all the things. And I got that. But that also means that I need to be much more proactive about managing relationships in the home. And I need to be more proactive about meeting that dog's needs on an individual basis. Um, I think a lot of times with clients, you know, I'll see that a, a new dog will come into the home and they kind of think, oh, well, because I've gotten into this routine with all my other dogs, right, where they all just kind of go out and potty together and they all go for walks together and that's always been enough, we kind of forget that we need to evaluate each dog always on that individual basis. And so, yeah, she can go in the yard and play and run around with Lennon, who she adores, right? Um, but she needs more than just that. That's not going to satisfy her. And if we don't meet her needs we're going to see some undesired behaviors that we don't want getting rehearsal time, right? So we definitely need to make sure that we need to evaluate each dog in the home and make sure that their training needs, their social needs, their enrichment needs, um, their ability to just be a dog um, are all met on that individual basis. And that I think is what's going to help set you up for the most success for peaceful and appropriate interactions between the dogs. It's also about making smart choices, looking at the dogs you have, like, okay, are, are my lower energy dogs higher energy in this moment? Mm -hmm. Like, are they in a position where they're ready to meet my new dog halfway? Mm -hmm. And that's the moment you put them together. Yeah. The <laughs> moment you put them together is not when the two other dogs are napping in the other room. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, and, and don't use your existing dogs as babysitters no. either. Right. I know one of the things that, um, you know, Chelsea, it's like drilled in my head. One time she was like, I don't want my dogs to tell the other dog off. Like it's not their job to set all the limits. Like, yes, there's going to be some commu communication, some limits, but like, let's not just let them work it out because working it out can turn into a really big problem. And that's where we're the parent, we're the guide to say, Hey, Hey, hey remember, <laughs> we don't need to be doing that to him. Uh, and I will literally say to Ahsoka, remember, that's Norby. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> right. And I think, too, um, when you're thinking about adding a dog, like how much do you need to know? Because a puppy has a lot of unknowns, depending on how young they are. They are who they are. But also, we're, they're not, um, you know, perfect clay that we can mold them into whatever we want. Like they're still that individual um, that is going to have the energy or is going to have you know, maybe they're um, more of a nuisance where they're like, yeah, I like to poke the bear. And you're like, that's not going to work for a household. You know, like yeah. our dogs don't enjoy that. Um, we've got a few more questions here that I'll go through. Um, Abby has another question. Do you teach any skills with the group around distributing treats, food without everyone attempting to snatch from each other? So yeah. let's get into that. Like, let's talk about 
you know, we have two, we're adding the third. What are some group skills you like to implement either before or when we add the third? I like to teach a pattern game for receiving traits. Okay. So in terms of like individually each dog, I want to make sure that they can sit. I want to make sure that they can follow a hand target so I can reposition them. And then I also want to teach them, hey, wait for this treat to reach your mouth. I'm going to, I'm going to like hold this treat out. We're going to move it so slowly. And I want you to hold your body still. And every time you're holding your body still, this treat gets closer to your mouth. But if you move, I'm pausing. I'm not taking it away. I'm just pausing. And so they learn that stillness is what creates that treat for them. And that's when I start putting the dogs together. That's so uh, And like, <laughs> usually like when they're brand new to each other, you don't even want to do this like without a gate in between them because you just don't know yet how they're going to handle this dynamic. And especially if you have a young dog or that you haven't taught a lot of things yet, like it is very likely that they're going to move and fail and try to snatch something. And mm -hmm. early on in the relationship, like there's not, there's not room for that yet. Like the dogs don't have positive regard for each other where like another dog snatching their treat is not that big of a deal. So I think like taking things slow, practicing, but what I, what I essentially do is I like to just name each dog and then feed them and then that's it. And then what you, you also don't want to cluster them together. You want to give them space so that they are not all on top of each other. So it is harder to <laughs> steal. <laughs> And do you use like stations or do you just like, if I ask you to sit, I really need you to stay in that location. So well, yeah, I think it's the individual work of teaching kind of that sit and that anticipation of the treat. So separately, I will teach them, hey, I'm going to name you and feed you and I'll do it over and over again and kind of just layering in more dogs until they know that that is this procedure, that is this game. We sit in a circle, we get fed on our turns and it will happen over and over again. And we each get something each time. It's going to be even. And like this game, it sounds very simple, but like I have used it when people, guests are walking into my house. I have a client who uses this game when she's hiking with four dogs and there are bears. Like just having this really easy pattern that they are used to playing in a ton of context is a really great way to lower arousal in a hurry. Nice. Love it. Great. I love that. I use that a ton in my home. Um, and we'll even begin to, you know, my younger one is not quite there, but the older two, I add in a positive interrupter so I can stop them from doing what they're doing. And then they can come to me and focus and kind of take a breath. Um, and I think that's kind of important too, to like evaluate is he, does each dog have a foundation that's necessary for this behavior before we do two together and then we can do three together, right? And making sure that whatever game you're playing together, no matter what that game is, that each dog is playing at the level of the least skilled dog, yeah. right? So that every dog can be successful and we're not having any oops or failure moments. Yeah. Um, the other one I really like to do in multi-dog homes, especially when we've got three, because three can become chaotic, right? <laughs> That's why we're having this conversation. Um, I really work on group relaxation. So I'm really big on teaching a settle on a mat. Um, so no matter where I am in my home, I want to be able to say settle. They run to their beds, they lay down, and they chill. And it's kind of a way to turn them off when they're a little aroused and I want to chill and not do something, right? But I also want them to be able to practice that as a group because what I don't want dogs to assume is that every time we're together, we're always playing and it's always animated and something mm -hmm. exciting is always happening, right? Which especially if you're bringing in a younger dog and I'll, again, I'll use my home as an example here, I've got a one-year-old, right? And so she is play, play, play all the time. And so oftentimes when she's with Lennon, um, who is her best playmate, they are ripping and tearing in the backyard and running around and wrestling and that's great. But I don't want her to assume that just because she's around the older two dogs, that means this high arousal, lots of fun, high energy stuff is going to be happening, right? I need them as a base default in the home to be relaxed. And so I think kind of fluctuating those moments of play and things that are exciting, but also then defaulting back to relaxation. Um, and for her right now, based on her training level, we still have management set up 
right? When we're doing that group relaxation, but I want her to be able to find success with all of them kind of taking a breath and relaxing and being chill together. And I think that that's also essential in managing these complicated relationships in indoor spaces that are generally tight and do have some, some triggers for the dogs. Yeah. Um, I have a question or um, not from the group. We have a couple of good questions from the group too, but the topic of management has come up, mm-hmm. you know, you both said management, you know, you don't just throw them together straight away. Contrary mm-hmm. to popular belief, it's okay to go slow. Um, and slow might even be the best um, outcome. But when you talk about management, what are some things that you're implementing to manage them? And, um, you know, how do you know when like, okay, I can lessen the management or what kind of management to implement both physical as well as maybe there's, I know for me, um, one of my management tools is I can call Norby like that. So if I see something not going great, if I catch it fast enough, if I say his you know recall cue, he's going to be like, gotta go. You know, gotta go. And that's, it's a management tool for me, right? Because I can get them out of there soon. So talk to me about some of the things you've done and things you recommend for people when it comes to integrating and managing the household, you know, initially and long term as well, since dogs are developing like our, our young dogs. Uh, I really like to use management to a level where I can, uh, like, say th- this is the day my new puppy has come home. We brought fish home the first day. He did not see the other dogs that day. So I had a setup in which the dogs could not come into contact at at a single barrier. They could not make visual contact in the house. All he could do was smell them in the house and see them. And it was the same case for the other dogs so that I could have those moments of like, hey, my dogs have noticed each other. They've heard the other dog in the other room, or I have brought a scented item into their space that smells like the other dog. So that we can pair that with really good things and start building kind of this positive association before they're even interacting on levels that people would think of, mm-hmm. you know, and even, even after that, the first time they see each other, they don't need to see each other face to face. They can see each other at a distance. And it can be short and supervised where you're, again, you're really intentionally going, hey, you looked at the other dog. Great. I'm going to give you a treat. Or, hey, I uncovered this barrier. You guys can see each other. Now I'm going to hand you your Kongs. And then the visual goes away. And wow, great things happen when you see these other dogs. So, but that requires layers of barriers in a way that a lot of people are resistant to or don't know that like they could do in their home or why. Um, But like peeling back those layers of gates or exercise pens or doors or um, blankets covering visuals over time, like what I'm looking for in making those decisions is what social behaviors are my dogs having? Like, are they gravitating towards the towards the barriers to be near each other? Like, do I have good body language? Is this loose and wiggly? Are we trying to bring toys to the barriers that are spaced apart? Like, are we thinking about playing? Um, you know, and then actually taking that time to make sure, like, if we have a young dog, we might not have skills yet where we can go, hey, move away from the barrier. But I'm definitely going to test my older dogs to say, hey, can you respond to me? Are you in an arousal state where you can listen to my, you know, cues and what I'm asking you to do? And I want to have all three of those pieces happening before I'm going to bring them closer together. And those first impressions, Katie, are so important. I, I, we don't really think about it until it's like, oops, you know, and I know I've put dogs together faster than I think I should have and had to back off and it's worth it. It's worth the time and the energy. And it goes, it goes faster than you would think. And it almost made me think of, you know, when you think of uh, zoo animals, when they're trying to introduce mates and things like that are different yeah. to the group, they do the same thing, right? They like introduce the smells and they switch, you know, different enclosures, like, we're doing the same thing with our dogs. Like, how cool is that? <laughs> Chelsea, did you have anything to add about that? I know you were very slow and cautious with your kids. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other thing to think about too, as Katie mentioned, a lot of people in their homes are quite resistant to putting in management. And I totally get it. I mean, I have a almost open concept home and the idea of like adding a whole bunch of X pens and baby gates can be stressful and it can kind of mess with what you're used to. But I think, first of all, it's important to remember that 
just because we're putting this in now doesn't necessarily mean all of it's going to be permanent, right? I mean, to some extent, even when I had before my puppy, I had three adults in the home and we still had management and they all got along. They all were integrated, but there's still moments where you're going to pick and choose in a smart home to continue to prevent problems, right? But whatever you're setting up initially for introductions or puppies and teenagers, that all doesn't have to be permanent. So try to think of it that way because I think it'll make you a little less resistant to putting it in, right? It's those early steps, those early foundations are so key to setting up what that relationship is going to look like for the rest of their life. So it's important to do it. Um, I think the other thing is to kind of look at your individual home and figure out where your current dogs are spending the most time, right? Where right now is like their safe place, their place where they go to chill during the day, or they, maybe they remove themselves to go take a nap alone. And these are spaces that I think that it, we still want them to be able to access with the management up. So even if I'm separating the new dog from my two existing dogs, I want to make sure that that access isn't going to restrict the existing dogs in a manner that's going to cause stress. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to make sure is if our third dog is a puppy, we have frequent outdoor needs. I want to make sure that my access for that puppy is going to include easy in and out access. That doesn't mean I'm having to cross barriers all the time and invade those older dogs spaces if they're not ready yet for that interaction. So I think really thinking about all of those things before you bring the dog home is going to help you set your home up in a way that really works for everybody involved. Yes. And we've talked a lot because I, I didn't think about, you know, we've all added puppies as our third, yeah. uh, our most you know recent addition. You know, if you're getting an adult dog from somewhere, you're getting a dog from the shelter or a rescue group, there's a lot of decompression time that's mm -hmm. really valuable too. So, you know, yes, we were kind of talking more about puppies because that's just our most recent experience. And that's very common for our clients too, to add a puppy because they think like, oh, okay, you know, it's a, it's a little bit less baggage, right? There's still baggage there. Um, but you, they need that time to decompress and it gives you time to bond with them and get to know them too. So take your time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a question here and it's totally, we were just kind of talking about it, but I want to bring up their question. When managing interactions between a new dog or a puppy and resident dog, how do you determine when they're ready for more interaction? And Katie talked about that. We're struggling with the puppy viewing any interaction time as play time and not being able to settle when given more direct interaction time, but quickly settle when created penned in the same vicinity. So anything you want to add to that kind of comment question regarding uh, settling time and um, that excitement when you get together or be in the same room together. My, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, Kate. No, go ahead. <laughs> My first um, thing with, so usually one of the big problems here is that when you transition over the barrier, it's not orderly enough. So we are starting from excitement. So the pattern game I like to play with the naming and feeding the dogs, I like to teach the dogs that before I'm transitioning them into the same space together. Um, the other piece is sometimes these dogs literally need us to practice settling individually, then practice settling like with a double barrier with a gap in between and then creep the barriers together, then a single barrier, then literally like creeping the door of the gate open. Like you, you can break it down that finely for them where they start to learn like, hey, we can really be calm in the same space. But you can also create activities for them when you bring them together that facilitate calm. So if you have a setup in your living room where you can keep the dog spaced apart, say on like tethers to furniture, people have dogs on leashes where they can't come into contact and you can sit down with them when everyone's in a calm mood and hand them a Kong or hand them a bone. And that's going to help like an activity that will facilitate just relaxing together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fabulous. I, to add to that, I would say I'd also consider the needs of that other dog. I assume we're talking about a, a puppy, I think you said. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, puppies have more needs all around the, the board. Mm -hmm. um, and it's real hard for them to relax unless needs have been met. And if we're a teenager, right up until about 18 months of age, 
that's still true. So I would say whenever I'm practicing anything that involves relaxation, I always want to make sure the dog's needs have been met. So long line sniffy walks, some play and training in the yard, something that's going to take the edge off and kind of help bring that level down just a little bit is going to help set that puppy up for success and make them more likely to be able to relax. The other thing I would add is that it's important to evaluate kind of what gets your dog excited, right? Um, sometimes the other dog's moving to their mats. That movement is enough to be like, oh my God, we're doing something, right? So maybe we need to practice. Yeah, maybe we need to practice like the other dogs finding their relaxation spot while the puppy still has all of that management, right? Mm -hmm. So looking at that environment, sometimes food is a huge excitement trigger for dogs, mm -hmm. right? So maybe I've been training with jerky and that's like a real high level treat for my dog, right? Which normally I'm all about the high value treats guys. But sometimes <laughs> if I'm really looking at like arousal and excitability, maybe that's adding just a little bit more to that you know, excitement scale that I don't want. So maybe assuming we're inside and distractions are low, I drop the value of that treat or pay the dog more quietly, change, right? Like change the food and the food delivery system to a manner that is a little bit calmer to, again, just doing whatever I can to help set that young puppy up for success. Yes. And doing things like calming yourself, you know, calming music, scents, you know, things that will help you because if you're worried about adding in this other dog, which I definitely have been, um, I needed to be in the right headspace as well, in addition to teaching the dogs the skills to do those things. Um, Tim had a question about what about building and maintaining the primary relationship with you? So I know she's added a new little French bulldog to her household um, and Oftentimes, you know, if, if the dog's like playing with each other, they're like all about each other and they're like, bye, like the human's not important anymore. And we've talked about some of the things like, you know, playing the pattern games and the name games and having separate training time. Is there anything else you would add to like, how do you, when you have existing relationships, really build this new relationship up while still maintaining the others? I, I like to look, and this is something that I've actually talked to Katie about quite extensively, um, is looking at my individual relationship with each dog, um, evaluating not only what those dogs needs are in terms of like exercise and enrichment, but also what they enjoy and making sure that I'm setting aside separate time for each dog each week to do that special one-on-one -on -one thing. Um, that I, I have found personally that for me, that really helps me maintain a relationship that's very individualized with each dog. And I think that's really important, not only for making sure that you've still got that connection and, and they're still responsive in a training setting, but also I think it fills that emotional cup up to the point where you're less likely to see undesired behaviors or problems with the relationship because they're just happy, right? They're just satisfied. So while I do a lot of things where all the dogs get to come, I also do things that are just one-on-one -on -one with each dog. And I make sure that my partner also does things that are one-on-one -on -one with each dog so that everybody still has all of those individual relationships as well as this, this new group relationship that we're developing. I think for me, when it comes to relationship and building a new relationship with the puppy, um, we had conversations ahead of time because you know, we have, we have his and her dogs. Uh, and so, you know, okay, how is this third dog going to relate? Like who's going to be the primary? What are, what are the roles going to be? And then having those conversations ongoing um, for those who know Norby know that, you know, he's a mama's boy and he needs a lot of mama time. So I don't give each dog the same amount of attention. I don't. And I thankfully, you know, my husband can tend to the others and that works out great. I mean, if you don't have someone else, you really need to think about, what that's going to look like in your household, um, but really focusing on what does Norby need? He is the priority, except for puppies also like number two, because the puppy is developing and puppy needs a lot more, but still maintaining because if I slack off in one area, it's going to create a problem in the, in the dynamic of the entire household. I think too, in our multi-dog homes, people feel guilty about not bringing all the dogs and doing all the things with everybody. Yeah. 
And so, first of all, I just want to say, like, that's okay. You you can choose that one on one you'll time. You'll still feel guilty. <laughs> yeah, you might still feel a little guilty, but you know, they, the other dogs at home don't really know what's going on. They don't know everything that you're going to do. So, hopefully, that helps a little bit. But I do find too that if we always try to bring all the dogs to do all the things, you can accidentally create problems or miss out on key training moments because let's face it, having three dogs with you out doing things is hard. It is a lot of work. I'm not reinforcing attention and check-ins and recall and stationary behavior and impulse control in the same way if I have just one dog with me versus if I have three with me, right? And so there are a lot of benefits to doing those one-on-one times that in the long run will actually make it easier for you to be able to bring all the dogs to do all the things. But I do think it's important to kind of pick and choose who's going to do the thing and and why, and, you know, make sure that you're giving each dog a little bit of one-on-one time. Well, I know when I feel guilty too, that sometimes I have to remember like, Fish may love this activity, but Phoenix won't. So Phoenix is actually very happy being alone at home right now. She does not (laughs) need to be here on this activity. And it's okay for them to have, you know, for honoring their, their interests and their needs. Like it's okay if they are different and it's okay if that means you need to separate them. Yes, 100%. And Abby was totally, I didn't realize her question was exactly what we're talking about. Uh, but she was talking about, you know, how do you manage the guilt and the human side of it? Like, it is a component um, of it because you want the best for all of your dogs and you want to have that great relationship with them. But they are individuals and they have different needs. And and the same thing I will say for, you know, because we're trainers and we want people to work with us, like, it, you also have to prioritize your budget and your time training, you know, and how you're going to do all that. You don't have to have, I mean, if you choose to, you could make sure everybody has the same amount of time and the same budget, but you can also say, Hey, who is the priority here? And then you have to prioritize from that. It's just part of having multiple dogs. You absolutely cannot make everything like equal and even all the time. It's just not realistic. And you'll make yourself a little crazy um, trying to do that. Um, we all still try. No, don't get me <laughs> <laughs> These are words, not reality always. <laughs> so let's transition into, um, you know, we've integrated the dog and let's say it's not gone well. You're going to make mistakes. Even we make mistakes as professionals. Like nobody is perfect. I'm the first to admit, and I've shared that openly, the challenges we've had. One how long do you wait till you're like, this isn't working? Like, what are the things we're looking for? Um, Because rehoming is, there's a stigma around it. Um, Even if the dog's lovely, um, that you want to rehome, like, what are some things that you're like, okay, if this isn't working, how long, and there's no perfect answer, how long are we going to work on it if we've done everything we've recommended until we're like, hey, this isn't working? I think most of my clients are in kind of these really difficult situations where we've actually had aggression and deterioration of relationships in the home. Um, And typically I'm seeing them years into the problem. So the first thing I'll say before we get to that is if you start to see daily tension between your dogs, then is the time to go talk to a dog trainer. If you have just a little hint of a concern about a dynamic that's happening between your dogs, the earlier we can intervene, the er the easier it can be. Uh, In terms of rehoming, I'm not always looking at like a time scale, like how long have you been doing this? Um, I know, you know, we all know that 12 to 18 months is kind of a good, uh, time scale for kind of integrating dogs. But sometimes we're living in situations where you don't feel like you have 12 to 18 months. So when I'm thinking about, you know, is rehoming or is, you know, returning this dog a good choice, I'm starting to think about, okay, what does your case look like? Do you have this escalating daily tension between the dogs? And for whatever reason, we are unable to effectively intervene about it. Maybe you have a ton of other things going on in your life. Maybe this is not what you signed up for and you are just emotionally not there. Whatever the reason is, if we can't intervene, 
it can escalate. And what we don't want to have happen is escalate to the point where we've had aggression between dogs, because that's going to take some of our ethical rehoming and returning dog choices off the table sometimes if the aggression goes too far. So if you're having that and you're in this place where like, I can't do this anymore, like, yeah, maybe we need to think about it. Um, Things like a lack of positive interaction between the dogs, like anywhere in the history. Like if, if you've been doing this for a few months and you've had just nothing positive between the two of them, it's stares and growls and lunging, like that, that's not a good sign about where this is going. Um, and like homes where you've got safety issues going on, we have, we have dogs where like, we're worried they're going to fight, but like the, the management scenario of how these dogs need to be separated for whatever reason is not possible in your home. And that goes back to, again, we don't want to escalate farther than we've gone because then we're, then we have complicated choices and it's really hard to rehome the dog. And I think too, like you are a human being and these are, I don't want you to live a life that you hate for like 18 months, like, or even, you know, some people do this for a decade. Like, it's not good for you. It's not good for the dogs. Like, there shouldn't be shame in going, wow, this match doesn't work. And some of them just really don't. They just Mm -hmm. don't work. And some people cannot live the, you know, crate and rotate life where dogs have to move around dog Alcatraz now and forevermore. Like, it's too much for them. And so we have to create space for that as, you know, professionals and, you know, breeders and rescues who are receiving these dogs back to be like, I get it. And we can find a better home for this dog where it's not going to be so stressful for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was brilliantly said. I can't say that any better. I'd say the one other thing I would add to that is if there's a human safety component, maybe, you know, somebody elderly living in the home, maybe there's young kids in the home and nothing super bad has happened yet, but we're really concerned about that route being a likelihood or because of the home we're living in management is not realistic to keep Mm -hmm. double barriers and to keep dogs really truly separated um the other thing i would say is that you know katie kind of touched on this mental health component of the human Mm -hmm. some people I, i think when we look at what we as humans and paula i know that you and i have talked about this on road trips like what are we okay living with If our dog had behavior X, Y, and Z, I might be fine with it. And you might say, no, that's like, that's a deal breaker for me. I can't do that. So everybody's answer is going to be a little bit different about what they are willing and able to deal with on a personal scale. But I think if you're at the point where you've sought out reliable professional help, you've had that consultation, you know, and you're just thinking, this is just something I can't do. You know, I think that it's okay to just say that's okay. You know, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy for anybody involved, but sometimes it's the best. And like Katie mentioned, to do it on the earlier end before something else happens, because then we've got a dog maybe with a bite history or a dog that can't live with kids or a dog that can't live with other dogs. And all of those little details that we add to, you know, their resume, their CV as a, as a dog, these are things that will change the kind of home that they are able to live with or the kinds of places that could responsibly take them. And so I think the sooner you get help, you know, the, the sooner you get everything organized, the better. And then just stay in touch with yourself and whoever else might be living in the home, you know, and if you're having those thoughts, talk to professionals, you know, trainers, your vet, veterinary behaviorists. They're all there for you at a professional capacity to, to be able to have those difficult conversations with. Yes, and it's not an easy thing. I've had to do it myself um, to rehome a dog before anything got terrible. Um, but I'd also say don't don't make changes too soon. You know, so often people are like, it didn't work the first week, like get another dog. It's like, well, you know, it may have gone too fast. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's no magic amount of time, you know, it all depends just like in anything good in training, it all depends, but really, you know, having a support system, um, having, you know, 
not everybody is us, but you know, having people who are very empathetic and who will talk through it. This is your life. It is not our life. We get to walk away and you know, <laughs> you know, live our own lives with our own crazy dogs. Um, you know, you have to make that choice and it can be very difficult, be very emotional because you love your dogs. Uh, even the first day you meet them, for whatever reason, we are designed to like bond with them for the most part, uh, those big, beautiful eyes that they have. So um, don't feel bad uh, if you do need to make a change. Um, you know, so often, um, I know in the horse world, horses have new owners all the time. Those horses live 30 years and it's like no big deal that you sold your horse. But when we get down to dogs, man, that is a whole other ball of wax. Like there's tons of, you know, um, challenges around that with people, um, even when they're doing it responsibly. Um, Tara here, I'm glad you're here. It sounds like you're having some challenges. She has two uh, female dogs that always got along, but due to several fights breaking out due to an overprotective mom with her puppy, it has trickled down to these girls beginning to fight as well. Uh, they've been separated for the past several months without success with reintegrating them back together. Um, she's been muzzle training, good job for safety and doing leash walks side by side with separate handlers. Also a, a very nice thing to do. Um, but they still are hyper focused on each other and um, they're really a trigger to each other, even with some gates. And that for, for Tara, I say reach out to um, someone here on our group today because that that is the reality. I mean, a lot of people are in Tara's position. Um, it's sadly not uncommon uh, because we try to integrate dogs. I had two female dogs who lived together, you know, for three years wonderfully. I have pictures of them laying together. Um, and then it wasn't working. Uh, and this is before I have the tools I have today. Um, maybe I could have made a different impact back then. Um, but, you know, being open to getting support and, and Katie and I have had these conversations and I'm sure Chelsea and I will too, is that, uh, you know, you may be on your fifth trainer before you really get the help that you need. Um, not everybody specializes in multi-dog households. Not everybody has the same philosophies. Um, so don't give up <laughs> um, with this. Do you Lise, have anything to share for um, Tara in regards to her situation with her girls fighting? I would add, you know, definitely harp on the trainer. Um, as most people, I, well, not maybe most people, I shouldn't say that. As <laughs> most trainers know and many dog people know, uh, the dog training world is unregulated, meaning anyone can just call themselves a dog trainer um, or, a behavior which, <laughs> or a behavior consultant. Yeah. So yeah. Um, just because they've had experience in dogs for a very long time does not necessarily mean that they have the tools to handle a challenge like this. And even if they are a certified trainer, not all certified trainers have skill sets to do, you know, certain specific things. So I would definitely say, um, make sure that you're looking in the right places, um, looking for trainers that hold professional certifications, diving in on their websites. You know, what kind of accreditations do they have? Do they specialize in anything? Um, what kind of methods do they use? Because these are all things that are going to not only impact your experience with that trainer, but also impact your success. Um, and one other thing I'll say, which I, I'm sure Katie will um, nod her head to because we've <laughs> talked about this before, is that integrations are hard. Um, getting dogs to, you know, be comfortable around one another is hard. And sometimes the tools that we currently have in our toolbox are not enough. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that conversation of is this doable is over. It just means we need to find another professional who has all of those tools that they can then share with us because parallel walks are really wonderful. And that's, you know, like Katie said at the beginning, that's kind of what you find on the internet is like parallel walks. Um, but oftentimes it's not quite enough. We've got to get down into the triggers that are happening in the home and, and those feelings of those dogs around one another that are happening in the home. And that's hard. You know, it's not just teaching a sit or a down, which a lot of pet owners can do. You know, it goes a little bit more beyond that. And so it gets a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll just... You know, I have most of my clients, like 90% of my clients are dealing with exactly this problem. Like dogs have fought. They cannot be in the same room together. They can barely be in the same house together. It really takes a wraparound approach of getting that full history of these dogs, 
what their relationship has looked like over time, what this event was that precipitated things, you know, down to all of these details and um, addressing the dog as a whole being, like not just this one issue that you're having between the dogs do we have other behavior issues that are coming into play that are feeding some of this Mm -hmm. do we have unmet needs that need to be adjusted uh do we have underlying medical issues so when you're looking for a trainer you really need someone who's going to dig deeply into these dogs histories and come up with a plan that makes sense for them I think too, like I love parallel walks. Usually in my process, parallel walks are coming later uh, when the dogs are a little uh, safer together just on site within the home. I think it's a lot, can be often a lot to ask of clients to execute these parallel walks with dogs that they are feeling nervous about and juggling the leashes and everything. So personally, I like to see procedures where we are starting in the home where the problem is happening. And typically when I'm seeing growling at the behavior, at the barriers, like you're describing, unfortunately, often the answer is more barriers and more space between the barriers Mm -hmm. Uh, and kind of working through things very, very slowly over time. There are, there is a lot of hope for these cases in a lot of, a lot of the time. Like I, I, I've seen some very concerning, very scary cases resolved. And I've seen some cases that didn't scare me that didn't. So I don't want people to feel bad about themselves when they have a dog aggression problem in in their home. It can happen to anyone. It's happened to me. If any of you come talk to me in a free consult about your your dog aggression problem, we can talk. But yeah, it it happens to people and it's not your fault and you're not to blame Mm -hmm. and you deserve help through this very complicated issue that's impacting your daily life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen to that, Katie. Like, yes. You know, and there's there's so many components to it. Right. And um, while we, you know, have our dog, it's an ebb and flow. It is never a stop. Right. So, you know, while all three of our dogs um, in our homes are getting along and, you know, it's groovy right now, it's a balancing act. It's an adjustment. Right. Especially with developing dogs is, you know, Katie has um, senior dogs. Chelsea has senior dogs. It's like, it's going to vary. And then when you have young dogs and senior dogs, like, wow. Um, and so, you know, things can be going great and then they not be great. And then you can go back to great again. It's, it's pretty amazing sometimes what is possible in terms of rehabbing these uh, dogs. Uh, but it takes time. It takes support. It takes the right support too. So thank you all for being here for this conversation. Like all the good questions, um, continue the conversation in the comments. I also will put links to um, everybody here. So if you do need follow-up support, um, you've got it. (laughs) Like you've got it Um, both virtually and in person, depending, or we can network you with someone uh, in your area that we would recommend. We're all very picky who we recommend. Uh, (laughs) See me in good hands. Um, Anything else you ladies would like to share before we say goodnight? The only thing I would say is that make sure you're really looking at why you want a third dog, who that dog is for you know, and being proactive about setting things up from the start. And if you don't know how to do that, it's an awesome time to get a trainer involved before you bring that third dog home to make sure that you're nurturing that relationship in the manner that it deserves to kind of set your dogs up for the rest of their life. And the moment you start seeing anything that you think might be concerning, get help. That's the time to get help before a situation escalates and becomes a bigger problem. I think the main thing I would leave people with is like, if you're early on in your introduction and you're seeing things you don't like, and you're seeing things that scare you, it probably means you need to slow down. So I promise you throw up a couple more barriers and your life is going to get a lot better really quickly while you figure out what trainer you want to work with and who can support you. Like use those barriers, go grab them, go to Petco, put it (laughs) on the wall. I promise you, you will be much happier while you figure this out. Yes. And having someone to help you be accountable to slow down as someone who definitely has a gas pedal to integrating dogs uh, for myself, not for others, <laughs> is that, you know, having that support system is just key. Even if you're like, everything's going great, um, how can we make it even better? Or is there anything we need to look at? So 
um, definitely reach out for those resources. So thank you everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing pictures of your number three <laughs> very soon. Good night guys. Bye. Bye.